can have your Bibles handy, as has been common within this most recent series, uh, as we step into uh, the scriptures today. I, I don't have a particular scripture to go to with you. Uh, we continue, actually, this week in part two, sort of. Uh, last week, I preached part two of a message on the weapons of our enemies in spiritual warfare. And as I was preaching through it, I, I came to a point where uh, my time was up, but my notes were not, uh, which is somewhat of a rare thing for me. I tend to be pretty, uh, I tend to have everything to where I can get it through what I need to get through in the time that I need to get through it. Uh, such was not the case last week. So uh, we are in part three this week of now what will be four parts, at least, on the weapons of our enemy in the war that they rage against our souls. And today we continue with this idea. Uh, let's go ahead and review, actually, a little bit extra, and then, and then we'll, we'll catch up to where we were last week as it relates to the weapons of the enemy. So the first week that we were together in this, we talked about the weapons of false ideas. And I gave three general um, categories or three general concepts as it relates to the weapons of false ideas that we find uh, within the world, the flesh, and the devil that seek to draw us away from the Lord. We talked about the God of self. This would be this, uh, uh, the idea of self-esteem, self-worth, self-affirmation, self love, focusing upon yourself, loving yourself, building yourself up in that way. The faster that we realize, Christian, that it isn't about us, the better we will do, especially as it relates to our relationship to truth. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about others. And the faster that we can keep in our minds the, the true nature of the concept, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and might, and love thy neighbor as thyself the better we'll do. We talked then about science so-called. We were not speaking there of observational science, things that are observable, testable, repeatable. That's not what we're talking about. We're not even talking formally about the concept that I, I discussed of forensic science. The uh, idea of forensic science being that which rests in the realm of theory because it is in the past. It cannot be observed and tested and repeated. Forensic science deals with interpreting evidence, which, of course, will be interpreted in different ways depending upon your baseline assumptions. But science so-called is specifically those things which are called knowledge but actually operate in direct contradiction to that which God has designed or to the world in which, uh, in, in the manner in which God has designed it to operate. So science so-called is when people elevate knowledge but they elevate knowledge uh, above God or beyond God and seek to uh, pursue knowledge in contradiction to God, which of course is no knowledge at all. It is science so-called. It is lies. And then we have empty religious devotion, another dangerous and false idea. Moralism, traditionalism, legalism, these things that stand as idols in the heart to replace the true and living God. Because it's much easier to live by some moral standard than it is to actually have a heart that's right with God, isn't it? And so these are the weapons of false ideas. These are the things that the world, the flesh, and the devil can, can, can put into our lives that infiltrate our hearts, that infiltrate our minds, that draw us away from the truths of God's word, and that can leave us spiritually shipwrecked. Then we talked about, and this is still week one, the weapon of temporal gratification. The fulfillment of temporal lusts and desires as a stand-in for the true fulfillment in Christ. This is the idea of uh, we, we eat, we drink, and we be merry for tomorrow we die. Um, the pursuit of physical, temporal, carnal pleasures as a means by which to find contentment rather than finding it in the eternal. And we warned about this idea, this idea that we are replacing the peace of God and the contentment that God can bring with things, with, with lusts, with gratifications, whether that be sexual gratification, whether that be um, the ideas surrounding materialism and, 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 and the gaining of things, the idea that you're not content, so you have to go shopping, you have to go buy something, you have to have something new, uh, the next big thing, you have a perfectly functional thing, but you need the next better perfectly functional thing because the perfectly functional thing that you have now is not the one that you want anymore because there's a new personal, per, uh, um, um, perfectly functional thing that, that yet you, can, you can have. Uh, we can talk about this as it relates to relationships, a drama, desires, uh, the idea that, that, that there are many people. I was, talking to, <laughs> so I was talking to a lady in the jail this last week. This is the second week in a row where I've gone to the jail and I've had a woman come, come to, to counsel with me and, um, and she said, I can't handle the unit right now. There's so much drama. 
And so right now they've got that unit packed full. The ladies unit is packed full. And so there's a lot of drama going on right now. And she was asking me, why is this? And I said, well, here's the thing. A lot of people have grown up on drama, whether that's the sitcom culture where a person tuned in every week at the same time to their favorite sitcom. And the thing about sitcoms is sitcoms were supposed to reflect life, right? But the only problem is a sitcom is boring if you don't have drama. And so life was reflected as drama, always drama, right? Which means people grew up thinking that if they didn't have drama in their lives, then they weren't living life. And so if they don't have drama, they have to manufacture drama. And between that and the fact that if a person has a lot of time to sit and to be still without actually having anything on their plate like they do in jail, then they have to start thinking about themselves and see themselves for who they really are. And in order to distract themselves from their problems, what do they do? They kick up drama. Because if I can be in a fight, we see this in politics, right? If I can be in a fight, then I don't have to worry about, I don't have to have my house in order if I can be constantly pointing to everyone else's house. And so I was explaining this to her and she said, oh, wow. That really makes sense. What is all of that? That's all temporal gratification. That is all me seeking to replace peace and contentment and these things that God is supposed to work in me with some sort of physical, temporal solution in order to distract myself or to give myself a measure of something that is akin to a synthetic replacement for the peace of God. And then, of course, last week we were beginning in this idea of the weapons of spiritual prohibition and limitation. The weapons of spiritual prohibition and limitation. And what I focused on last week, what we got through last week, was spiritual prohibition. Those thoughts and those emotions that work themselves in our minds and in our hearts and seek to convince us that God does not want us, that God does not love us, that God is angry with us. And we contrasted this through the contrast of guilt and conviction, right? We speak of the fact that both guilt and conviction lay a weight of sorrow and a feeling of separation from God upon my heart. But the difference is that guilt is something which God has not laid on my heart, but rather either my, my own heart, my, my, my deceitful, sinful heart, as Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Or, or the, the oppressive elements of, of Satan and of, of, of the wicked one has laid upon my heart this, this feeling of guilt or the separation. And guilt causes me to hide from God, to run from God, to feel a constant unworthiness of God that no matter how many times I confess something, no matter how much I try to satisfy my guilt, it remains that there is a weight upon my heart that is calling me to hide myself and to separate myself from God because I'm not worthy or because I have a misunderstanding of who God is whereby I feel as though God will not accept me. Now, we, as we talked about this, God accepts no man, right? But the God man, but, but the man Jesus Christ. Guilt ignores the fact that Jesus has already taken our sin on the cross and holds you under a false weight, a false shame that either makes you feel separated or causes you to separate yourself from the love of God in, in, that, in, in the idea of, 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 rela- of fellowship, right? And holds you under that weight, which makes you absolutely ineffective for God. Because if you're living under a constant weight of unworthiness and incapacity, you're never, ever, ever going to be usable for Him. So this guilt remains, and I can do all of these various things to distract myself from the guilt. And this often carries me farther away from God, as as we just mentioned with temporal gratification, as I try to cover my guilt or appease my guilt through empty religion and moralism, through temporal gratification, through any of these things to try to appease the guilt. And this is very different from the nature of conviction. Conviction is still a weight of sorrow and a feeling of separation, but when I bring it to the Lord and when I confess my sin and when I lay it before His uh, his throne, there is a release because conviction does not call me to run from God. Conviction is God opening His arms and saying, come back to me. Get right with me so that we can be back in relationship. God did not write this big of a book to then stiff arm you when you come to Him. He wrote this big of a book to show you who he was, to bring you nigh, to get you to him. That's what this book is about, calling you 
to him. And we know that is the character of our God. And so that's the difference between guilt, shame, condemnation, and conviction. And I call that spiritual prohibition. And this is, again, one that I deal with quite often in the jail, where people feel unworthy as they should. I do too. But they don't yet, they haven't yet put the pieces together to understand that they don't have to be worthy because Christ is worthy for them. Right? And that's spiritual prohibition. We talked about that last time. I'm not going to uh, stay there. This week we're talking about spiritual limitations. And we're going to talk about fear, anxiety, and timidity as our general examples of spiritual limitations. So spiritual prohibition, those things that would prohibit us from coming to God. Spiritual limitations, those things that are more limiting. And I spoke about this just at the end last week, the idea of, of, of fear that I can't measure up. And because I can't measure up, God can't use me. It's not necessarily a guilt idea of I feel like I'm in any particular sin, but it might be more the idea that I don't know enough or I'm just not, uh, I'm, I'm not spiritual enough or whatever it might be. Fear, anxiety, timidity, weapons used by the enemy to convince us that God's power cannot be manifest in us, that we cannot overcome those things which the Bible says we can overcome, that we cannot be used in the way God says he wants to use us, to make me fearful of living or speaking in the way God wants us to live and to speak boldly for Jesus Christ. If Satan can hold us in fear, he can hold us in ineffectiveness. And do take note that the nature of fear is to produce the same results as the nature of shame, guilt, and condemnation. All of these emotions are intended to repel us, to cause us to back away from usability, not to draw us near. Shame, guilt, and condemnation, when contrasted with conviction, serve to compel us away from reconciliation and fellowship rather than towards these things. And in much the same way, fear is a limiter, an inhibitor, causing us to flee rather than to draw nigh, causing us to quit rather than to aspire. So let's talk about fear. It was not too long ago Nathaniel preached to us a message about fear. And he made a point, a very good point, that the functioning of fear is directly related to the nature of knowledge. That knowledge of a thing will deeply influence the degree and the manner of my fear. When my kiddos were younger, they had an overactive fear of large animals, which was mostly manifestly seen, at least, in interaction with dogs in our neighborhood. So we would walk around the block, and there were a couple of larger dogs in our neighborhood, you know, the 60 to 70 pound range. And uh, we'd go up, and we'd pet the dog, and they'd see us petting the dog, and it's all wonderful. And oh, look, the dog, and a happy dog, and a nice dog. But my children would be extremely uncomfortable around these big dogs. And they'd go, and they'd touch the dog. And then when the dog turned toward them, ah, you know, and then they'd run away. And, and, and they had this, this unhealthy, I'd say, fear, an overactive fear of large animals. Now, a fear of large animals in a sense, is a very good thing, right? Uh, understanding that animals can be dangerous is a very good thing. There's most certainly such thing as a healthy fear of animals. Even animals that are domesticated and trained, it's good to have a healthy fear of animals. One must always understand their capacity to harm. But this was unreasonable. And our solution to this unreasonable fear was to increase their experiential, experiential knowledge of large dogs. Now, there's various ways that we could do this. The way that we chose to do this was to get a large dog. And so we have a large dog. And as my children learn to interact with this large dog and to like this love do the large dog and then eventually to love this large dog, their fear turned from an unreasonable fear based upon ignorance and lack of experience with large dogs to only the natural and healthy fear of recognizing the capabilities and strengths of large dogs. And so they're careful not to let our large dog step on their foot because that's not going to feel good if our large dog steps on their foot. And they know not to yank on our large dog's ears and large dog's tails because our large dog is not going to be all that happy if they yank on her ears or they pull her tail. Did I say tails? She only has one. Um, a yank on her tail. And so these are things that they have learned and they have understood because now they are no longer in ignorance about large dogs. And so now they are comfortable around large dogs. And this knowledge shifted their fear from unhealthy to healthy. Now, consider this as it relates to the Christian life. We all have fears. 
The nature of those fears is dependent upon many and various factors and circumstances. Various experiences which have made you afraid or things which have allayed your fears. Not only what you have seen yourself, but what you have seen and heard from others. Some of these are entirely controllable, other ones are not. I've never had a fear of heights. I spent years uh, uh, working on roofs when I was in high school. Uh, when I was in, in college, no, no problem. I, went, I would go back home and I, I would roof in the, in the, well, in the winter, sometimes in Colorado too, but also you know, in the summers, and, and that was all well and good. And then there was a time uh, after my wife and I were married where we were working uh, at the, the school where, where we were working and, and we were in charge of the rock wall. And I had an accident where, where I fell from about 20 feet uh, off of that rock wall onto the ground. Since that point, regardless of how much I got back on the horse and everything, there is a psychological difference for me when I am at heights. I haven't been able to get over it. I still mentally say, well, it's no different than it was before. I know what happened. I know what went wrong. I know why it went wrong. It was an accident. Uh, it doesn't need to happen again. It never needs to happen again. And yet, psychologically, there's just something there. My hands get clammy. Uh, there's, just, there's just a little bit of a difference now when I am at heights. There are any number of experiences that we have in our lives that shade our fears, that shade our concerns. Some of them are controllable in that sense. Some of them are not controllable in that sense. There are ways that we see ourselves, what we've seen and heard from others, experiences that we've had, experiences that others have had that we don't have, uh, things that we're ignorant of, things that we're entirely knowledgeable about, and all of these things set or allay our fears. And these fears can be broken into numerous subcategories, right? What I just described to you as it relates to heights is a issue with a physical fear. Fears about people, fears about places, fears about circumstances, fears about your health, fears about the health of your loved ones, fears about finances. These are physical fears. These are things in this world, connected to this world, to the temporal, to the material. There are emotional fears. Fears of failure, fears of rejection, fears of abandonment. And I'm not saying that these are all wonderfully put into categories in our lives, right? You can have something that happened to you physically that, that brings about not only a physical fear, but also connects it to some emotion. And something spiritual. There are spiritual fears. Fears about God's judgment. Fears about hell. Fears about sin. Fears about sharing the gospel. Fears about boldness. And as we consider all of these, we can divide the nature of fear the same way I would parse my children's fears as it related to dogs. There is such thing as a healthy fear. The idea that big dogs are strong, animals can be unpredictable, and so I approach them gently, confidently, carefully, that's a good thing. You approach animals in a certain way. If you don't approach them in a certain way, they can become nervous, they can get edgy, they can do things that they would not otherwise do. This is the, uh, it's also the idea, as, as we relate to this idea of healthy fear, I take care of my body. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to have problems. And so I eat in a certain way and I exercise in a certain way. And I, I don't take unnecessary risks with my body because I have a healthy fear of becoming uh, ill or incapacitated or whatever the case may be. This is the idea that I save money instead of spend money in anticipation of a rainy day. That I have a healthy understanding of the fact that uh, living life takes resources. And so I don't just blow all of my resources in, in the good days because I understand that good days can't last forever. And so I save, right? I go to the ant and I consider her ways and I become wise who works in their season so that they may have for the, the season of, of need. The idea that I don't walk down a dark alley in the middle of the night alone, that, that, that's a healthy fear. That I'm not going to go into a place that is potentially dangerous and put myself in a place of obvious vulnerability because I have an understanding of, of human nature. I have an understanding of, of the nature of people feeling, feeling comfortable doing things in the dark, the nature of, of uh, uh, people that, that prey on the vulnerable if I'm alone. Notice that these healthy fears compel me to wise solutions. The idea that I recognize God is holy, that I am sinful, and so I flee to the cross for forgiveness and redemption. These are all healthy fears. And, I, and they compel me to wise solutions with the intent that these wise solutions function to satisfy my fears in order that I might live my life in peace and confidence. And then there are unhealthy fears. 
physical, emotional, spiritual. This is the idea that because big dogs scare me, I run away every time I see one. I don't walk because I fear that a big dog might be walking at the same time. I avoid my neighbors because they have one. That's unhealthy. Or because I might get sick, I live in constant fear. I don't interact with others. I become compulsive regarding sanitation and diet and these sorts of things. It becomes unhealthy. The idea that in fear of financial problems, I become miserly. Specifically, I refuse to give. And I reject generosity because I am so miserly. Excuse me, lost myself in my notes there for a minute. And so as we think through all of these things, even, even as it relates to the spiritual, that though I've aligned myself with all that God has asked of me, yet I live in torment regarding my spiritual state and my condition before God. And the question that I ask as I think through the, uh, the idea of healthy fears and unhealthy fears is how do I know the difference? After all, people are all quite different, aren't they? We have our own experiences that color our concerns. How can I know when a fear goes beyond just healthy concern? And someone else might look at my fear and say, well, you're being a little bit overzealous there. And I can say, well, no, I'm not because of what I know. I know wh where, where I'm standing, where someone else might not see that. How can I know? How can I know when a fear goes from being healthy and prudent to unhealthy and maybe even sinful? And this is where, like with everything in the Christian life, we boil it down to a principle, to a heart condition, to a motivation. I can't look at your particular concerns intrinsically, see the outworking of that concern, and say that is inherently unhealthy. I might be able to with certain ones because certain things just go too far. But with many of them, well, maybe you know something I don't. Maybe you've experienced something I don't. Maybe you have a weakness I don't. And so you need to, your, your healthy fear goes beyond what my healthy fear would take me unto because of your particular needs, because of your particular situation. But is there a way that we can boil it down to where we can understand what is a healthy fear and what is an unhealthy fear? Principle, heart motivation, heart condition. With many of the unhealthy fears I just mentioned, they drive you to a circumstance where you become self-focused, where you become circumstance-focused rather than God-focused. If your fear drives you to self-focus or circumstance-focus, drives you away from being God-focused and God-reliant, it's unhealthy. It's not in the right place. When at once fear strips you of your peace, when at once fear strips you of your contentment and your joy, when at once fear strips you of your confidence in God as your guide, your provider, and your protector, when at once your fear drives you to disobey the commands of God, your fear is unhealthy, out of balance, and in the case of disobedience, it's sinful. Let me give you an example. Ephesians 4.28 says this, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. As Paul contrasts the action of the unbeliever with the action of the believer, he contrasts, the contrast is actually not stealing with working specifically. Notice this. But rather between taking what belongs to another to satisfy myself and giving what belongs to me to satisfy others. It's not just let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work. But it's rather let him work or labor with his hands, the thing which is good, in order that he may have to give. Do you see the contrast? Let him that stole steal no more. The idea of stealing is you have something I want and I'm going to take what is yours to satisfy myself. The idea of working unto giving is I am going to labor with my hands and then I am going to take what is mine and use it to satisfy you. This is the contrast. We could also speak of this as it relates to general financial and material welfare. 
Jesus spoke of this in Matthew chapter 6, right? You're familiar with the passage, beginning in verse 25. Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more, uh, 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 and the body more uh, than raiment? Excuse me. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, they don't plant, neither do they reap, gather, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Saving, frugality, Good financial discipline, these are excellent things. The primary means by which God provides for his people is by giving men work sufficient to support the needs of himself and his family. Earning money, financial investment, proper spending habits all contribute to functional comfort, at least as we experience it in this time and place in history, right? There's a lot of people around the world that don't experience that with their labor. But we do, for now. But if your job, or your money, or your investments, or your spending habits are the thing you are trusting in, if in the absence, loss, or threat against these securities, you become fearful and unbelieving, well, then your faith is in the wrong thing, right? Because God is able to give you what you need. And he calls upon you to take no thought. That doesn't mean that you don't plan. It doesn't mean that you're negligent. But you don't rely on those plans. It doesn't mean that you don't care, but that you aren't full of cares. You aren't anxious because of these things. So if my fears in this area of provision strip from me my contentment, strip from me my faith, then I can know without controversy that these fears are unbalanced, misguided, out of hand, perhaps depending on how it plays out even sinful. And, then, and of course, we could give examples of this in every realm that I spoke of previously, where what it is, is it's not so much about how it is that I'm directly applying the principle in the physical, it's about what the principle is and am I actually loyal to the principle itself? Is my heart in the right place? Have I allowed my concerns over the things of this life to override my faith in the promises of God, in the provisions of God, in the commands of God, in the elements that God has called me unto as it relates to my relationship with Him? Regarding health, right? It's fine, it's wonderful to live healthy, eat healthy, exercise regularly, avoid the things which you deem to be dangerous, etc. But if on the principle level, if on the heart motivation level, now we have people in here that are taking all manner of, of, of actions or inactions as it relates to um, um, the way that we live our lives for our health. And none of them are in, in inherently wrong or imbalanced or out of, or, or, or out of sorts or, or fearful by motivation. But if in our hearts we are relying upon those things to define our wellness, our reliance is in the wrong place, right? If in absence of the lifestyle that you desire to live, you are stripped of your contentment, you are stripped of your joy, well, then there's something wrong. If you stay awake at nights worrying about these things, you're not living in the peace of Christ. Now, if you stay awake at night because your health is bad, that's different, right? But if it's, if it's a heart issue, if you are living in fear, then you've got some things misplaced in your life. If your fear of danger is so great that you refuse the leading of the Lord to do something or to go somewhere or to join in something or to serve someone, your fears have driven you to disobedience. For we believe that God is the one who determines the day and the hour of our death. And this does not mean that we tempt God with recklessness as it relates to our health. For this is also sin and comes with its own consequences. But 
as I exercise a healthy fear and as I, I exercise a responsible care, I then trust the Lord with the rest, right? This is the idea. This is the principle. That's the principle as it relates to money. It's the principle as it relates to health. It's the principle as it relates to every single area of our lives where we might have fears. The same with my safety. If I refuse to minister because of the dangers of interacting with unsavory people or with sinners or with evil men, then I'm refusing what God has left me here to do to begin with. And of course, the same is true with spiritual fears. Flee from the wrath that is to come. That's a healthy fear. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's a healthy fear. But when that fear is combined with the knowledge of the holy, we find that Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 30, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Following Christ is a responsibility and it is a burden to be borne, but it is an easy yoke and it is a light burden. We find Jesus promised that all who come unto him, he will in no wise cast out, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That Jesus designed for the life that is lived in him to be a life of fullness of joy. And so if I have identified who Christ is, if I have identified what he has done for me, if I have identified his promises, and I have aligned myself with those promises according to his word. We talked about in Sunday school the nature of belief, right? It's not that I, uh, uh, I know something. It's not even that I agree with something, but it is that I accept it. I appropriate it unto myself. If I have done that, then what have I to fear? In this life or the life to come. And if you do fear either the things in this life or the things of the life to come, May I suggest that you are lacking somewhere, either in knowledge of what God has said or in faith to appropriate it. Because the principles on this are manifold. Let's consider the verses together. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Why should I fear violence? Why should I fear illness? Why should I fear the wrath of man? Why should I fear cancel culture? Why should I fear my government? Why should I fear tyrants? Yes, we have a healthy fear of evil. I don't run into the meat grinder. It's not the way to do it, right? We have a healthy fear of foolishness. We have a healthy fear of danger. But not a thing on this earth, not even the things of the spirit realm, can touch the part of me that really matters. They can't touch my relationship with God. They can't strip me from the love of God. They can't take from me my hope in the life that is to come. They can't take from me my eternal rewards. As a matter of fact, as history bears it out, whenever evil, seen or unseen, seeks to strip me from the things that matter most, dignity, freedom, wealth, life, most to them, not to me, the things that matter most to them, they try to strip me from my, my finances. They try to strip me from my opportunities. They try to strip me from my, my, my dignity. They try to strip my reputation from me. If I handle it the way the Bible tells me to, simultaneously with them stripping from me the things that matter most to them in this life, they are giving me the means by which to earn eternal reward, aren't they? They are giving me the means by which to exercise patience, love, forgiveness, and to earn on the other side of eternity great reward. That's interesting, isn't it? Paul said it this way. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. It's not an unheard of thing to have our, our fears of, of, of physical or material lack, persecution, shame, sorrow, or danger flood toward us. It's not an un, un, uncommon thing for Christians to have to deal with these material problems. What's different is the way we respond. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know what we just read there? Confidence. It is not that Paul did not have fears and distresses and persecutions. It is not that there were not troubles. It is not that Paul did not have health problems. As a matter of fact, it seems as though he had some major health problems. It is not as though Paul was living at ease. In fact, it seems as though he had a lot of unease. And yet he said, the thing is, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us because nothing that this earth can do unto me or can lay before me can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. The negative circumstances of this life often brought on in the heat of spiritual battle as weapons used by our spiritual enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, strike to the heart of fear and so keep us from confidence and keep us from obedience and keep us from spiritual victory as these losses work in us a fear that causes us to flee from the Lord. Paul says we don't have to do that. Because tribulation and distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and peril and, sword and, 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 and the sword, the things that in the seen world, the things in the unseen world, the governments and the rulers, the huge multinational corporations, they can't separate you from the love of God. They can't touch your relationship with the God who has promised to love you and to care for you. They can get to your body, but they have no power over your spirit. They can't strip you of your joy. They can strip you of those things which would typically define happiness in this life. They can strip from you your freedom. They can strip from you your wealth. They can strip from you your family. They can strip from you your comfort. They can't take your joy because that's the fruit of the Spirit. They can't touch the Spirit. They can't strip from you your peace because that's the fruit of the Spirit. They can't touch that. They can't strip from you your contentment. They can't strip from you your confidence and your hope. When Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You notice the unconditional nature of his contentment. They can't strip that from you. And sometimes they try. But other times, the enemy will simply, instead, seek to distract you, lie to you. Instead of trying to take it all away from you, they might actually give to you instead. See, because if they can't take these things away from you, if they can't separate you from the love of God, then maybe they can get you to separate yourself. Not from salvation, mind you. John 10 says that no man can... Can, 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 can pluck us out of our Father's hand. What I'm talking about is fellowship, joy, peace, contentment. If the world, the flesh, and the devil can cause you to be afraid and to run to things other than God because of your fears, if they can put so many replacements in your life for contentment and joy, such as temporal gratifications, that they can strip from you your reliance upon God and rest your fears in the loss of those things which don't matter, these temporal things, then they can actually dupe you into holding the things of this world and the promises of this world to come at such a level that when they threaten to strip them away or even you are, are, are worried about it yourself, just having these things stripped away from you, it will plunge you into faithlessness. If the enemy can call you to forget the promises of spiritual rest and contentment given by Jesus and place upon you a spiritual fear or physical fears, guilt, shame, condemnation, as we considered last time, then while the love of God is still there for you, you will be compelled to reject its efforts and its effects and live instead in a state of ineffectiveness for the Lord. And if Satan can't have your eternity... He can at least undermine your witness and your testimony and your effectiveness in this time. And that's what fear does, Christian. 
That's what unhealthy fear does. It strips from you your birthright in Christ. And it holds you under that, which is not only unnecessary, but it holds you under that which will keep you ineffective for him. If at once the cares of this world, the lies regarding the world that is to come, from the world, the flesh, or the devil, can override your knowledge, the knowledge that tempers your fears, that makes things only a healthy fear, if, if they can override that knowledge or strip from you that knowledge, then the enemy in the spiritual battle doesn't have to be able to touch the spiritual part of you because you will do it yourself. If the world, the flesh, and the devil cannot touch the spiritual part of you, then the only strategy they have is to cause you to shift your loyalties, to lose perspective, to lose focus, to be in ignorance enough so that you will do it to yourself. The enemies of the spiritual battle don't have to persecute me to silence my witness if I'm so afraid to speak out for the Lord that I silence myself. If I'm so afraid to lose my job that I silence myself. If I'm so afraid of angering my neighbor that I silence myself. If I'm so afraid of not being accepted among my peers that I silence myself. If I'm so afraid of people not liking me that I silence myself. Then the world doesn't have to silence me. I'm self-censoring. If I muzzle myself, if I put my own candlestick under a bushel, if I allow my own salt to lose its savor, then they don't have to do anything to me. Fear, anxiety, timidity, these things are insidious weapons of the enemy specifically to cause me to limit myself as it relates to God's desire and capacity to use me. Now, this is a presentation of the enemies, not the solutions, right? But with all of these things, as we've said already, the solution is knowledge and faith. Know what the Word of God says. Believe what the Word of God says. Obey what the Word of God says. If you're struggling with fear, pursue the knowledge of God's love. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Knowing God relieves us of the kinds of fear that the devil can hold over us. Fear of failure, fear of loss, fear of shame, fear of indignity, fear of death. If I know the God of the Bible, if I know what this God has said to me, if I know his character, and I don't just mean if I know it in my head, if I understand my God, if he is your God, and if the God of the Bible is your God, then that Romans 8 passage is, is yours. Then the reality is you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Then nothing can strip from you the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That's where God wants you to live. And if you're not living there, it's because you're lacking either in knowledge of who God is or in faith to believe that he, that is your God. The devil uses this fear to hold us in frustration, to freeze us into inaction, to make us unusable, to cause us once again to turn our eyes upon ourselves rather than to turn outward and pour our lives into others. It is true that the more you invest in others, the more pain they can inflict upon you. Nathaniel talked about this a couple of months ago. That was the, 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 mount, the rat trap illustration, right? But is such a limitation that I'm not going to invest in others because of how it might, uh, the danger it might pose to my well being, is such a limitation an outworking of godly fear or of carnal fear? Is it, the, is, it, is it godly fear or is it the lie of my heart or of the devil to hold me back from investing in another because of my fear? I don't want to give to the need of another because I need that money for myself. I don't want to invest emotionally in the needs of another because I've been burned before and I don't want to be burned again. A lot of people aren't in church for that very reason. Because some pastor has hurt them. Some church has hurt them. The question is, is that a godly fear of, of being hurt again? Or is that a means by which the world, the flesh, and the devil is twisting fear, is twisting your, your, your concern in order to hold you back from that which God has ordained for you? Is the hand of God shortened that he cannot see us through our pain? 
Is God incapable of walking us out of darkness into light? If God leads, will he not also sustain? Fear is therefore a great weapon in the arsenal of the enemy to hold men in despair, to cripple men from effectiveness, to bring about a condition in the mind of man whereby they are convinced that failure is inevitable, that victory over sin, over sorrow, over shame, over any number of elements of this world is not attainable. Fear poisons the mind, and it is a poison that we would expect to be pervasive in the minds of those who are not in Christ, the ones that Revelation calls the fearful and unbelieving. Struggling with anxiety, these sorts of things. But it's also one that is quite common in Christians. For those who would struggle being anxious, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is still in our Bibles. Be careful. That word literally meaning full of cares, anxious, for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep, guard, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Don't allow anxiety to overwhelm you, to override your peace and your joy, to overcome your capacity to live in godly contentment or to be used of God effectively. Are you, gonna, are you gonna have things over which you are care, full of cares? Yeah, you are. Do they have to remain there? No, they don't. Take your cares, thankfully and confidently lay them at God's feet. And then here's the big part of it. Leave them there, right? And experience God's peace. <clears throat> You're not experiencing God's peace? The peace of God which passes all understanding is not keeping and guarding your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's something then that you're not leaving there. You can know it. Now that doesn't mean that you're in open rebellion. That doesn't mean that, it, it just means you've got a blind spot. It means there's something wrong. It means that, that, th that there's a place that needs correction. Maybe you can find it yourself. Maybe you need a brother or sister in Christ to help you through it. Maybe you need to spend more time in prayer in the word of God. But, but there's something wrong if you're not experiencing the peace of God because it's there for us. And if we believe the word of God, and if this is the God that we serve, then it's there for us. Easier said than done, Pastor. I didn't say it was easy. But it is simple. It's not a complicated process. That doesn't mean it's an easy process. Strive for it, though, Christian. Strive for it daily. This is your birthright in Christ. Don't settle for less. Don't allow the enemy of this spiritual war to strip from you the abundant life Jesus secured for you through his death on the cross. He's already paid the price. Take a hold of it. Finally, what about timidity? Well, there's an answer for that one too. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Paul is exhorting Timothy here to use the gifts that God has given to him to take full advantage of, of the anointing that has been placed upon him. And he says this, the spirit of fear, that word fear here is not the typical word for fear, actually. This is a word which specifically means timidity. Timidity is not from God. The spirit of God and the spirit from God grants power, love, sound mind. If that's not what you're experiencing, Recognize that there is something in your life that has uh, succumbed to an unhealthy timidity, an unhealthy fear. Again, I'm not saying that you're, 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 you're hopeless or anything of the sort. As a matter of fact, I'm saying the exact opposite. But we look for these things in our lives as markers of where we are with God and of what is controlling us. And if I live under timidity, I'm living under a lie. And the call is to reject the lie and to seek unto that which is of the Spirit of God, power, love, and a sound mind. So we believe it with our heart and we obey it with our body. The weapons of our enemies in the spiritual battle. The weapons of the world, the flesh, and the devil. They are many. They are potent. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Do you believe it? Because it's true. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. Whether you take advantage it or of it or not, the power is there. So the question is, will we live in fear? 
Will we live in anxiety? Will we live in timidity? Or will we live in the power and the love and the sound mind that God has purchased for us through his, the death of his son, Jesus, on the cross? Nothing in the material or the immaterial world can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But have you, again, not in a salvation way, in a fellowship way, in an abiding way, in the power of God sort of way, have you separated yourself from the power of God to live out his joy and his peace and his contentment in you because of fear, because of anxiety, because of timidity? Have you succumb to the spiritual limitations that define the weapons of the enemy? Have you allowed the enemy through some material or immaterial means, through some experience of your past that, you, that you're hanging on to that you can't let go, from some terrible circumstance that I, I, I am by no means attempting to minimize in any way, but are you allowing physical circumstances to, to be an anchor upon your spiritual prosperity? Don't allow it to be so, Christian. It's a weapon of the enemy. This is not of God. It doesn't have to be that way. For nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's close in prayer. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.